I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and Director of this Mental Health Expert Series. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Jesse Borelli, an Associate Professor of Psychological Science at the University of California, Irvine, to speak with her about her pioneering work on parent-child relationships and mental health. So thanks for being here today, Jesse. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I was wondering if I could start off by asking you a little bit about the kind of mental health work that you do. Yeah, in my work, I've been most interested in trying to understand um, more about the dynamics and relationships that impact the patterns that we learn about um, the world and how the world works and how relationships work. And most importantly, the messages that we internalize about ourselves that then impact um, the impact, the ways we learn to regulate emotion and how that impacts our mental health. And I've mostly been focused on how that impacts children and how that manifests within the parent-child relationship. But I've also done some work on romantic relationships and family relationships as a whole. How did you first start doing this really important research? Well, I think you remember how I first started doing this important research um, because we were kind of in it together. Um, I. I would say that I first became an observer of relationships in my own life um, in that I was really, really fascinated by the way my own family worked. Um, and so I kind of would say I became kind of a naive psychologist as a child, um, which might sound funny to say, but I think I was always interested in people and the way people worked and the way relationships worked. And then when I came to college, I learned um, that there was this amazing discipline out there that allowed me to think and kind of codify in a scientific way um, the way relationships worked and the way we could think about emotion and put those two things together um, and start to even layer them on top of one another. And uh, my first research experience was with you um, at a lab that we were in together and, and Dr. Ann Kring's lab working on some projects related to schizophrenia and emotion. And then I kind of continued that and built upon that, working with some attachment um, labs at Berkeley and at UCSF. Um, and I think for me, I had this kind of pivotal research experience when I was in college where I worked at a lab run by Alicia Lieberman at UCSF, um, where I really got to see, she runs this treatment project working with mothers and young children who have been exposed to domestic violence. And she takes attachment theory and she's developed this amazing psychotherapy program called Parent-Child um, Psychotherapy. And um, she's, it, for me, it was the best illustration and my first exposure, importantly, to the ability of a scientist to take this really complex theory and turn it into a treatment. Um, and that just blew me away because, um, and also I was really inspired by her as a person because anybody who knows you can tell you that she's this person who just really embodies, I think, the perfect marriage of science and um, master clinician and who managed to kind of, manages to kind of balance both of those hats um, at all times. And so I, I at the fir for the first time, kind of saw that those two things being held in balance and thought that's what I want to do. So. That's wonderful. And from that starting point to where you are now, as you kind of look over the trajectory of your career, what have been some notable, you know, frustrations and challenges um, as well as, you know, successes that you've been able to savor? I feel like I've had a lot of challenges. Um, <laughs> uh, academia is full of so many rejections. Um, grant rejections, paper rejections, all kinds of challenges. Um, and I think that for me, one of the biggest hurdles is that I think um, I chose to pursue an academic position that was probably not the best one for me first. So my first um, professor job was at a liberal arts college. And I thought, I thought at the time that that was really the best fit for me. Um, because I thought that teaching was where I wanted to be, spend most of my time. And, um, and it turned out that I figured that out fairly early on in my time in that job, but um, then was kind of sidelined by raising children and dealing with other things. And 
it took me a long time to switch jobs. And so um, I think that was probably my biggest hurdle is that it took me a while to get into the kind of position that I'm in now where I really feel like I can pursue the kind of work I really want to be pursuing in this really unfettered way. So that was that was really hard and I was kind of watching, I felt like for a long time I was watching from the sidelines as a lot of my friends and colleagues were getting to do these research projects that were just amazing and I really wanted to do them and I couldn't do them. Um, but I actually would say that probably my largest challenge would be my own self-doubt, um, which probably a lot of people can relate to. And I think that in a way that might be what held me back all along from pursuing a job at an R1 institution, even though I, I probably didn't figure that out for a long time. Um, but I'm working on it. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's something that probably plagues a lot of people in this field. But it's hard to talk about and it's hard to confront and it's a work in progress. I mean, thank you for being so open and candid about, you know, the challenges and the self-doubt, you know, that come along the way. Um, and I mean, also in light of the fact that you've been such a successful and amazing kind of clinical science too in the midst of all this. I don't know if you want to say anything too about all, or even a highlight of the, you know, successes you've had as a role model for many women in the field. Oh, thank you, Jen. Um so I, I will say that I think one of my biggest, the things that I'm proudest of right now um, is that um, over the last few years, I conquered this really big hurdle that, or at least I perceive this to be a really big hurdle, was that for the many years that I was working at a liberal arts college at Pomona College, I was trying for a really long time to build a successful community, a partnership with a community agency to um, work on this intervention, this parent-child intervention program that I had de been developing for Latinx families. And I had not been able to build a community partnership. So I kept approaching community agencies and not succeeding in building a partnership. And then um, when I got to my new um, academic job at UC Irvine, I have been able to build this partnership and um, it's been really challenging. <laughs> um, so, you know, when, kind of the building of the partnership is just the beginning is what I've learned. And once you build this partnership, there's all kinds of new challenges that await you when you're inside of the partnership and working within it and actually, you know, rolling out the intervention and working with the intervention, but um, actually doing the intervention. And uh, for me, working with these, um, this low income community of um, recent immigrants from Mexico and, you know, rolling out my intervention with this community has has been like such a dream come true for me. And we just finished our first intervention trial. So that is my biggest success that I'd like to share with you. And I feel like I'm kind of finally doing the work that I've been want, waiting to do for a long time. So it makes me really happy. That's amazing. And as you look forward to, I mean, what do you see as the most important next steps in the field for your work or, or more broadly? I think that we have a long way to go in our field. Um, I feel like this is a, incredibly exciting time to be a clinician and a clinical scientist um, because I feel like we've gotten to this point where we know a lot about these techniques that work really well with people um, in terms of changing especially our most common mental health problems. I think there are some areas where we definitely need to make significant progress but we do have a lot of tools that we know work and yet there are a lot of really big barriers to getting those tools to the people who need them and so i think that some of the challenges that we have are doing things like reducing health disparities um, increasing access to um, these amazing tools that we've created um, training a more diverse cohort of clinicians and clinical scientists um, using technology in a way that it can benefit people and, and still preserving what we know is really special about the therapist client relationship and really hard to replicate outside of this one-on-one -on -one or group therapy setting. Um, and so I think that these are really great challenges for this next generation of clinical scientists to embrace. And they're ones that people who have more technical knowledge than I do <laughs> are better equipped to tackle. Um, so. I mean, I think that dissemination is a huge, a huge area for growth within our field. 
And so my last question for you is what advice would you have for people who might be watching this interview today and are interested in the field or maybe want to get engaged? I think that my biggest piece of advice, which I think a lot of um, scientists try to train out of people, um, is that I think that your observation skills and your intuition are really important assets that you have. And those skills have to be refined and they have to be paired with empiricism um, and with science and with falsifiable evidence. Um, you have to be open to challenging yourself and you have to be open to, um, to learning that you're wrong. But I really do believe that you can hone your skills to become um, a very, very careful observer of human behavior. And that, that really is one of your most important assets that you can have. So you need to work to develop those skills and you need to learn to trust yourself. Um, and that people who are really keen observers of, of other people become the best psychologists. Um, so that's what I would say. Thank you. That's wonderful advice. And I just really want to say I appreciate speaking with you today, especially sharing some of the, you know, really human experiences we go through in this field. Um, so thank you again for speaking today, Jesse. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to be with my friend.